welcome to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. I'm your host, Amanda Thomas, and today we have another conversation with Dr. Anissa Ramirez. We posted a short interview with Anissa a few episodes back where she talked about her book, The Alchemy of Us, How Humans and Matter Transformed One Another. Anissa also spoke about her book at one of our Science on Tap online events in May 2020. However, my goal for these Barstool Chat episodes is to pretend like our guest scientist and I are able to sit at a bar and get a drink together and to find out more about them as a person. I want to know what inspires somebody to become a scientist and to get an inside look at what it's like to do science as a living. She has an interesting story, and I really envy the time that she got to spend in archives hunting down stories of science history. Anissa has a PhD in material science and has made the transition to being a full-time author and science communicator. If you haven't already, you should definitely go check out her book, and I'll put links in the episode notes. With that, here we go. Welcome, Anissa. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm curious, you have a PhD in materials science and engineering. That's correct, yeah. So what does a materials scientist or engineer do? (laughs) <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, and you're not alone in asking that question because, uh, you know, my mom doesn't know what a material scientist is. I-, I liken material science to my home state of New Jersey because material science is wedged between two more familiar things. For New Jersey, that's New York and Philadelphia. And for material science, that's actually chemistry and physics. A material scientist is interested in how atoms bond. So that's the chemistry part. And then a material scientist sees how those bonds translates into how stuff behaves in different situations. And so that's the physics part. So I'll give you an example. We all know that glass is very brittle. However, we want to use glass for our cell phones. How is it that the cell phone glass is uh, strong or more strong? Because I-, I see a lot of fractured cell phone cases. Sure. <laughs> well, that actually requires material science. We figure out what atoms to put into the glass so that it can actually be strong and so that it can be used for cell phones. So a material scientist is interested in designing new materials for new applications. So would you work for or did you work for a large manufacturing organization or or who employs a a material scientist? Material scientists are everywhere. Um, So uh, materials that we're interested in can be broken down into a couple of boxes, uh, metals, ceramics, plastics. So you could be working at a plastic company like DuPont, or someone could be working at a glass company such as uh, Corning. So material scientists are everywhere and they work on different types of materials for different types of applications. And they're usually in some group of engineers. You'll see a group of engineers such as mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. They'll usually be a material scientist among them. I know in your in your talk before you mentioned that one of your early inspirations was the the TV show Three Two One Contact, which I, I remember as a child as well. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm curious. I mean, you can certainly talk about that uh, as well. But I'm curious, how did you get into material science? That's uh, it, what were your inspirations? Well. I knew that I wanted to be a scientist because of that television show, 321 Contact. I loved learning about the world and how it worked. And then maybe in high school, I decided that I wanted to be a scientist, but maybe an engineer. And so when I headed to college, I was going to be an electrical engineer because my father did electrical engineering. I said, oh, I'll do something like that. And I have to say that I was taking a set of prerequisite courses, and then I started taking the classes for electrical engineering. And I have to say that I was bored to tears. And I was crying because this is something that I wanted to do. I had done some electrical engineering, but the way that it was being taught just wasn't interesting to me. The way my dad did it and the way I took summer courses, the way that we made circuits and things, I was so interested in that. But the way that the theory of it was not something interesting to me. So I was was in a bad way. I had to figure out what my major was. And also, you know, the dream that I had had kind of collapsed. So I had other prerequisite courses that I needed to take. And one of them was material science. And most of the people who were sitting in this class were were saying to me, well, you're going to hate this class. Everybody hates this class. And so I adopted that posture that my friends had too. But the first day, my professor said something that blew me away. He said, the reason why we don't fall through the floor and the reason why my sweater is blue and the reason why the lights work all has to do with the interaction of atoms. And if you can figure out how they do that, you can get them to do new things. 
Now, when he said that, I stopped paying attention to everyone around me because I had a new way of looking at the world. The, the objects around me were made of materials and the way that they behaved was because of the way atoms interacted with each other. This completely blew me away. And I said, you know what? I want to know more about this material scientist. And so it was that moment that put me on the path to becoming a material scientist. It was completely by accident. Yeah, I can imagine uh, with your description of that and, and just thinking of looking around at the world going, oh, that's not just a cotton shirt. That is a, a mass of atoms that are all interacting with each other in a, in a new way or a way that's new to me. And, and that would really change your perspective on things, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. It, made, it gave the world another layer. It was sort of like I was seeing the world in black and white with maybe a few colors. But then when I learned more about material science, more colors were in the picture. And so it, it became more and more vivid to me. Uh, I could see things and I could appreciate things on a different level. So what did you do after college? Once you, once you graduated with your PhD, you went and worked as a materials scientist? Sure. So, so after I finished undergrad, I knew that I didn't want to work and because I wanted to learn more about material science and I wasn't quite ready for the work world. So then I went to get my doctorate in material science at Stanford in California. And I thought that I was going to stay in California because once, once I was on the West Coast, I'm like, this is my world. I love it here. I'm not going to ever go back to the East Coast, which is where I'm originally from. And my mom was asking, when are you coming back? And I'm like, never, I'm never coming back. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, when I was at Stanford, it ends up that Bell Laboratories was hiring and they had not been hiring for a long time. And Bell Laboratories for someone in the sciences is like Mecca. This is where a lot of the inventions that we take for granted today were created. And so they came to campus to hire. And so I said, well, I'll, I have to do an interview because, you know, you got to interview, but I don't really want a job. I already have a job here, so it's okay. So I interviewed and they offered me a job in New Jersey, which is my home state, which I had said I would never return to. And I was like, well, you have to go back because they never hire. And this is, this is the best place on earth, in my opinion, to do science. So I went to Bell Laboratories, left the West Coast, went to New Jersey, which I never thought I'd do, and worked at uh, Bell Laboratories for a couple of years as a member of technical staff, which is just a staff scientist. And while I was there, I was working on uh, different kinds of things that were related to materials, had a couple of patents. I really had a blast being there. Uh, the guy who worked across from me, he had a Nobel Prize. It was really like a kid being at a candy store. So I never really wanted to leave Bell Laboratories, to be honest. But Bell Labs was part of Lucent. And at the time, the telecom bubble had burst. So things were just being cleared out. Companies and sections of the company were being cut off. And so it became clear that I needed to find another job. And so many of my friends started looking at academic jobs. I wasn't really thinking about that, but I said, well, okay, well, let's try that out. So that's when I took the leap and I actually went on to become faculty at Yale. So my path was getting my doctorate on the West Coast, never thinking I would leave, eventually coming on the East Coast because it's one of the best places on the planet was hiring. And then taking steps after that, after there was a huge economic shift. So you, we were faculty and now you are an author. How did that transition happen? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, I always saw myself as a teacher. When I was at Bell Laboratories, when I was at Stanford, I actually taught too. Uh, when I was a, a graduate student at Stanford, I taught at the community college. I taught a class or two in material science. And I really found that I really loved teaching material science. I love teaching, but love teaching material science. Material science has some of the best demonstrations. So it's very easy to convert people to, to love the field. And when I was at Bell Laboratories, I also taught. So I was teaching and I was doing research. And I said, well, that kind of makes sense. I should go off and be a professor. Now, when I was a professor, Again, I really found that I love the teaching part far more than the research because I had done really great research prior to Yale. And it was a little more difficult to get things off the ground when I was in the academic world. And so I was looking for other ways to teach. And that actually branched into creating videos and then writing descriptions of different science principles for teachers. And then I realized that I really love the writing part. In fact, when I was a professor and when I was a researcher, the part of research that I really loved was writing the papers. And so it all kind of made sense that, you know what, I think you actually like the communicating of science more than the research part. So that's what propelled me into being more of a science communicator, or as I call it, a science evangelist. 
Right. On your website, you give yourself the title of science evangelist, which I love. Um, But what does that mean to you? How do you evangelize about science? Well, it's a person who goes out into the world and expresses to the general public the importance of science, how they used to love science and how they can have a second chance at science. It's a, a person who communicates science, who explain science. And there's so many ways that you can do that. Uh, For me, I initially did some videos and that was a lot of fun. Uh, I started doing a podcast and that was fun. Uh, But where I thought that I really could focus and, and hone my skill for communicating was with writing books. And so that's how I explain science. Right. I, I want to come back to your podcast, but obviously the reason why you and I became introduced to each other was your book, The Alchemy of Us. Listeners, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you pick that book up. But can you talk a little bit about the process of figuring out what you wanted to research? And, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, the actual research aspects of it and the, the combing through the archives and, and how you felt about that part. Oh man, I could do a class on that. And it was something that I had to learn as I was doing it. I knew I wanted to write a material science book. And there are many material science and chemistry books out there. And they kind of profile the material. And and that's a fine approach. But I wanted to have a broader and wider appeal. I wanted to reach people who didn't necessarily think they liked science. So I knew I had to take a different approach. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to tell the stories of inventors, little known inventors, why they came up with what they did, what was their motivation, and more importantly, what was the outcome of their invention. And that's what I do in The Alchemy of Us. Now, in order to get those stories, one approach is to go to old books. But actually, what you really want to do is go back to the original material and look at archives of people that you're writing about. And so all over the world, There are libraries, associations, societies that actually have a room that most people don't know about, which is full and full and full of boxes, full of archives from people who are no longer with us. There are letters, there are papers and pictures, things like that. And so you have to spend time with these archives, combing through them and reading them. And from that, you can pull out information about a person's personality what was the concern of their time? What was their motivation? You get to know them, actually. And, and I spent a lot of time in archives and so much so that I actually started to feel like I knew these people. And you get to travel all over the world to do so. So when I was writing The Alchemy of Us, of course, I went to the archives in Washington, D.C., the Library of Congress. But then I went to smaller archives like in Kansas City and also in Connecticut. There's a few that I went to in, in California. And I went to England. So I am an introvert, but this book pushed me to do things that I didn't want to really do because I had to get the materials. I had to go to Texas. At one point, I was reading about one character, and I'm like, well, I think I have to go to Texas now. And so uh, I actually drew out a map and put a dot in all the states that I had to hit to make this book possible. So you spend a lot of time in these archives. You comb through those papers. What archives allow you to do is you can actually scan the papers because these materials are not available on Google. You have to go to the place, get the materials that you need, And then you scan those materials and then you read. And from those materials, you try and piece together what the story was. And then you tell that story. And so that was uh, the next part. So the raw material is the archives. And then you, as the director, if you will, have to piece together the materials to to tell their story. And, uh, And that's what I did when I was writing my book, The Alchemy of Us. Let's talk about your podcast, Science Underground. Well, Science Underground is a two-minute science podcast, which explains topics from how we create tires from lettuce to why leaves change color. And I created this podcast a couple of years ago because I was trying to support teachers. I was trying to give them some interesting things to bring students back to their desks, some science that's new or relevant or some, some question that, some pressing question that they might have. Uh, and have a way to answer it or provide them a way to answer these questions. And I also made them very short. Again, it's two minutes because I was also hoping that it might be useful for radio programs or again, you don't want to take up too much time in the classroom. And uh, in the process of creating Science Underground, what I would do is I would go to science journals, science, nature, things that lay audiences don't spend a lot of time reading. And then I would go through it and I said, oh, that's a very interesting topic. I I don't think a teacher is not going to understand that readily. So why don't I translate this article in a way that might be meaningful to someone who's 12 years old? And so that was my process in terms of uh, creating this program, Science Underground. 
Yeah, I I listened to a ton of them yesterday to to prep for this to just to so I could get an idea of what you were talking about and they're really fun. They're they're short and and totally digestible and and you cover a wide range of topics. Well, I have a wide range of interests and uh what's great is that uh I actually talked to a lot of scientists and experts and they were more than willing to chat with me. And what was great since it's only a 2-minute podcast, I would tell them, "Look, I only need 20 minutes of your time, I'm able to get what I need in that short amount of time. And so I learned a lot in the process. So it was part of my own education. And and one of the things I pride myself on is that I like to learn things, but I also like to share things. So spending time with these experts was great. And then I could translate what they were saying so that the general public could understand it too. It's part of that science evangelism, I suppose. That's right. <laughs> so what is something that you wish people knew about being a scientist? Oh, it's the greatest. It's the greatest. It's, it's, it's a profession where your job is to ask questions. People think that scientists are all about knowing things, and it's actually the questions that are the cool part. That's the thing that draws you to go find things out. I use that science part of my brain in, in writing my book, The Alchemy of Us. I had a question, and so I had to probe and interrogate to find things out. I want to know about this particular inventor. Well, I'm going to have to go to this archive to go find that information. Similarly, in the laboratory. I see this interesting effect. Well, what's causing it? Well, I ask questions and I put that effect or I put that material in different situations to see what makes it happen or what makes it not happen. So scientists are in the business of asking questions, which is what all children used to do many, many, many years ago. So in many ways, the difference between a kindergartner and a scientist is about just a couple of feet because we're just taller. Uh, We're in the business of asking questions just like kindergartners are. This might be the first time some of our listeners have been introduced to you, and some may not know that you are African-American. And what is something that you wish people knew about being an African-American scientist? And and also, what do you wish people knew about being a female African-American scientist? So being a scientist is absolutely great. And if we closed our eyes and didn't see who the person was, we're all in the same business of finding something new, of exploring, sometimes being the first to see something in the world. That's really amazing. In fact, that's what gets scientists up early in the morning because they want to see what they'll discover. And once they discover something, they can't wait for the next thing that they discover. But if we open our eyes, we live in a world where people make assumptions about people based on the color of their skin. And that's what corrodes science in a lot of ways. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I was at the Yale Faculty Club and it was at a banquet. And the only people there are people who are faculty. (laughs) So we can go with that assumption. There's some people who don't know me and they ask me who I am and I tell them who I am and they ask me what department I'm, I'm in. And I'm like, well, I'm in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, which is where material scientists often sit. And I think this person wanted to make conversation. And she said, you know what? You do a great job with the air conditioning and the HVAC. So what happened here was an assumption was made. Even though I gave information, her her thinking was clouded by that assumption. When I say mechanical engineering, she assumed the facilities, which wouldn't necessarily be appropriate because we're at a banquet for faculty. So there's a faulty logic that takes place in, in those assumptions. And that's, that's what happens a lot. And that's what a lot of people who are of color or the other have to navigate, that assumptions about them are often wrong and they have to make their way around those assumptions because sometimes they are barriers. Listening to your description of that conversation just makes me cringe. <laughs> I felt sorry for her, but I also was just trying to enjoy myself at a banquet. I mean, you know, these banquets are really nice, and now I'm not enjoying myself anymore. Right. And and one of the things that I'm hoping to do with these podcasts is to give a, a voice to more African-American and, and other scientists of color to, to tell your stories and to normalize the fact that you are scientists and you are worthy of, of being at the faculty banquet. And, and not that, you know, uh, not that the facilities department is, is anything to be ashamed of, but that's not who you are. And, and you are an important feature of the academic and scientific community. I, don't, I think they call these microaggressions. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Um, so lots of tours came through Yale and sometimes people would visit the classroom and that's fine. That's, that's the business of Yale. 
And so I'm standing up in front of the class teaching and a tour guide comes in and, and he says, may I see the professor? I said, well, look, I have chalk all over me. I have chalk in my hand and I'm standing in front of the room. Perhaps I'm the professor. You know, I just felt like I needed to be a little snarky because first of all, he was kind of interrupting my class. Yeah, I, I have a, a another speaker that I've worked with a number, to, a number of times who is who is white, but she is a mechanical engineer. And I was asking her some questions related to this kind of topic in a, in a feminism um, aspect. And she said, yeah, whenever I walk into the room, I make it clear that I am not the one making the coffee. Amen, And <laughs> uh, Yeah, <laughs> I, I can imagine that that is a, a minefield for you to navigate. Well, I also made a professional decision long ago not to learn how to make coffee because I don't, I don't drink coffee. I'm a tea drinker, so I don't even know how to make it. So I can't do it because I don't know how to do it. I think that's a wise thing. I personally love coffee, and, but yeah, that's not relevant. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Right, right. No, but I, understand, you know, but I knew I, what, I'm, what, I'm a, what I'm trying to address is that I knew that assumption would happen. Right. So I just made that not an assumption that could be pursued. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, so what is, you, you've written this book and you're obviously doing some publicity for it and, and being interviewed in various places and, and uh, unfortunately not going on a speaking tour um, right now, I imagine. Um, but uh, what is next for you? Oh, well, one of the great things about being a science evangelist is that you have a ton of ideas and you get to actually make them come to life. So now that this book is complete, I'm starting to work on another book. One book is about a 19th century hidden figure. It's an African-American woman who was an inventor who created something that we all have in our house, and that's the ironing board. She got a patent for it in 1892. What's so intriguing about her is that she was actually born a slave. So here's a story of a woman who was completely written off, who went and did something fantastic in the world of invention. So I'm going to write a children's book about her. I'm also working on another book that's related to technology, but also about some of the assumptions and biases in technology. So I'm working on that too. And the last thing that uh, I'm working on on the side is that I really want to explore other books about how to make material science interesting to lay audiences. So I'm still figuring that out, but uh, there's a couple of ideas that are floating around. Those all sound great. And uh, if, if I can do anything to help with publicity or uh, anything with that, we'll, we'll have to have you come back and, and do another talk when your next book comes out. That'd be fun. Oh, thank you. I'd love to do that. Yeah. So as kind of a final question, what is your favorite part of being a scientist? My favorite part of being a scientist is being okay with not knowing. I think a lot of people feel that they need to know. If they read something or if they meet something or they hear something for the first time and they don't know anything, they feel stupid or they feel insecure about not knowing. Scientists have the different approach. They're like, oh, I don't know. I need to pursue it. I need to push. And I love that about scientists. I love that about science because there's no way that you're going to know everything. And if you are in the posture that, oh, I don't know, so what I'm going to do is just pretend I don't know, or I'm not going to pursue it, or I'm going to be afraid of that thing. You're going to live in a very closed uh, world. However, if you take the posture of, I don't know, but let me find out, you're going to live in a world that's full of possibilities. So I hope that more people adopt that mindset of, of a scientist, because I absolutely love it. If I don't know something, if I meet someone who's an expert, I'm not afraid. I'm like, hey, I have a question for you. That's the posture that we should all have. And I, I hope that more people adopt it. I think that's a, a wonderful idea. And yeah, admitting you don't know something can be pretty difficult for some people, but, but I think it's a key feature to, to being a scientist and to having a scientific view of, of the world. Absolutely. Thank you for speaking with us today. This has been fascinating. And I look forward to having you back when we can have you speak about one of your upcoming books. Oh, thank you so much. I look forward to that day. Great. Thank you for listening. Normally in this outro, I'd be asking for a donation to help keep us providing free podcasts and events. And I will put donation links in the episode notes for any of you who are able to help out. However, I'm also going to take a quick moment to encourage you to read up on the Black Lives Matter movement or on one of the many other organizations working to support people of color in the U.S. right now. 
They could also use your donations of money or time, and I encourage you to find out ways that you can help. I'd also like to say thank you to Graham Tully for his sound production and for his patience, and to Jonathan Colton for the use of his song at Mandelbrot Set for our theme music. One badass fucking crack dump, and you're just in time to save the day.